Hi, my name is Samantha Swift, and for my midterm project, I will be discussing the effect of poverty on early adolescent physical and mental health. And before I begin, I just want to say that this topic is very important to me. I'm able to see some of the effects of this every day when I go to work, and I really enjoyed the opportunity to research some of the statistics and research behind this. So I've been teaching at Title I schools for the past four years, and a Title I school means that at minimum 40% of children from the school qualify for free or reduced lunch, which is determined um, if they live in poverty or not. And oftentimes, um, it's a lot higher than 40%. So for context, the school that I'm working at this year is 90% of students qualify for free or reduced lunch. With that being said, let's talk about um, what it means to live in poverty and what I mean when I say low income family. So this status is determined by the family size, the composition of the family and the income that they received in the 12 months prior to the survey. So this is constantly changing because remember that a lot of times that families are um, living in low income. Um, sometimes their income fluctuates throughout the years. And an example of this algorithm is um, a family of two adults and two children who make less than $25,926 a year are considered to be living in poverty. And this data is pulled from the Population Reference Bureau. Another thing to keep in mind is that this data is um, set throughout the country. So it doesn't take rent or area into consideration. And if we think about the rent in New York City versus the rent in um, a rural part of New York State, uh, that is going to make a big difference in what the family is spending on rent um, from their total income. So that's something to keep in mind that even though the number is defined by a certain um, algorithm, it doesn't take into account how much that family is spending on rent per month or housing per month. And we can take a look at the data from 2010 to 2019, and we can see that the number of children living in poverty actually decreased throughout the years. In the most recent year we have data from 2019, you can see that 17% of children in the US are living in poverty, which is still concerning, very concerning, because that's about one in six children in the US living in poverty. And something to keep in mind throughout this presentation too is that it doesn't have to be this way. So if we take a look at the industrialized nations, you can see that US falls second to last in childhood poverty, meaning that we're doing a very poor job with this. And the number for this survey from UNICEF is defined as families from, or the percent of children from zero to 17 living in households with incomes below 50% of the median national um, income. So for example, if the median national income for the US would be 50%, 50% of that is $25,000 per year. Or sorry, if the median income for the US is $50,000 a year, 50% 50 of that is $25,000 per year. So this is the number of families living in $25,000 per year or less. Again, keep in mind that it's not taking into account the family size, where they live, or anything, so it could actually be worse than this chart is showing us. So some of their physical health, um, and I just want to say this quote from Tom Boyce, who is a chief um, study of medicine from the University of California at San Francisco. Um, he says that socioeconomic status is the most powerful predictor of disease, disorder, injury, and mortality that we have. A lot of this is due to a lack of health care, um, which in the U.S. is for profit. So oftentimes low income families are always going to be doing worse with health care, um, following up with the prescriptions that they need to buy and going to doctor's visits just based on the fact that it's expensive. Um, so some main categories where the physical health effects um, on students are brain development and to reference this, there was a study from the University of California at San Francisco where they put this device on eight to 12 year olds that studied their brain activity while they were playing a game where they had to follow certain stimuli around. And it found that students from low income families in comparison with students from affluent families, um, they had lower IQs, less exec executive functioning. So things like memory, semantic fluency, cognitive flexibility, um, they're doing worse automatically. Children from low-income families are three times more likely to be overweight. 
So oftentimes in poor neighborhoods, or if a family is just struggling with money, they have less access to healthy food. Um, they have less options for what they can buy. Um, if you think about going into a fast food restaurant, even you can see that there's no salad or there's nothing healthy on the dollar menu. So a lot of times struggling families sometimes are forced into buying less healthy options. And students in low income families are more likely to get asthma. In fact, in the 2019 asthma capitals report, it shows that poverty was the number one risk factor for getting asthma. And some reasons for this could be living in an urban neighborhood where there's higher levels of pollution, living next to a highway, um, having um, mold or not really having uh, good air quality in the actual space that they're living in. Um, it has a large amount of effect on their mental health and the quote right there, stress might be the worst component of all. So in physical terms, stress increases the amount of cortisol in your body. And as an adult, you can probably imagine or picture the way that stress makes you feel today. And you can imagine what a student who is de still developing physically and mentally, uh, what cortisol is going to do to their body. So automatically, just the increase of that hormone is going to affect their growth and development. It's going to make them more prone to diseases and more prone to um, sickness. Here's a chart um, that shows the number of stressors for poor versus non-poor children. And some of the examples from that were stressors in this um, study were um, seeing violence in the home, um, not having a place to sleep, not having um, enough food throughout the day. So things like that, um, family members dying, um, family members getting sick, anything that will cause like traumatic incidents with the children. And if we take a look at this, um, again, something to keep in mind, it's not just that only poor children have stressors in their life, non-poor is included in this chart too, but you can see that the number of stressors that the students experience is higher for poor children. Whereas um, the amount of students who received zero or one stressors throughout the study um, were non-poor, and the number who received one, two, three, four, five stressors throughout their lifetime um, were poor children. Um, so in addition to these traumatic, stressful events that can follow them throughout their lifetime without proper follow-up, um, their households are often crowded and noisy. So I think about a lot while I'm remote teaching, if a student is in a crowded area, if they don't have a lot of space in their house, especially if they have multiple siblings working from home, that's going to create a stressful environment for them right now. Never mind um, even when we go back in person when they're coming home and doing their homework there. Uh, students who are from low income families are more likely to be absent throughout the year and more likely to move locations. So by being absent, um, moving locations more often, they're less likely to fit in with their peers um, where they might feel isolated from other children. Again, they might not have clean clothes every single day. A lot of times low income schools have uniforms. Um, this way students are comparing themselves. They don't feel like they have the newest styles because their family can't afford them. Um, so this is a lot of, um, it makes me think of the first week of class with forming their identity. Um, being Coming from a low income family is going to give them barriers to, to this. They have less resources to express themselves. And from all of these causes on their um, physical and mental health, we can clearly see the educational outcomes. So here's a study from College Board that shows how students performed on the SAT in each section um, in comparison to the, to the median score. So that black right, line right there is the national average. And you can see that it almost correlates perfectly with the students, um, every time your income bracket goes up for your family, your score increases. And likewise, every time your income bracket decreases, that score also decreases. So their test scores are automatically lower. The schools themselves have less resources. So this information on the screen is taken from a study in Virginia that shows how resources are affected from schools where there's a high amount of children living in poverty compared to schools with low amounts of um, children living in poverty. And one example from here is just that 16% of teachers are in their first or second year. Um, and that number is halved 
when we look at schools with low amounts of poverty. So those students are more likely to, um, teachers are more likely to stay and work at schools where there is not a lot of children living in poverty, um, which can really change the environment of the school and the way that they're interacting with the kids. A high turnover rate is not good for um, community building. It's not good for the students. Um, we wanna keep teachers at the schools. Additionally, um, whereas in uh, schools where there's a low amount of children living in poverty, you can see that 99% of schools offer high school physics, whereas in low, a high poverty neighborhood, 43, only 43% 43 of schools offer high school physics. So that's less than half of schools even offer the physics class in high school. I'll come back to that. Um, so college enrollment is also lower and we can see this clearly by income. Um, you are more likely to get enrolled in college if you're from a high income family. And one thing that this really connects to is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So remember that that bottom level, the physiological needs, um, poor kids are just less likely to have these needs met than kids from higher income families. So when we're thinking about educational outcomes, if kids don't have access to clean air, clean water, food, shelter, sleeping, um, they're not gonna be able to uh, reach higher levels on the pyramid. So if you're a teacher in a school where there's a high level of poverty, you could have the best lesson, you could have the highest education, um, you could have the best principal, the best administration, you could even have the best resources. But if children aren't meeting that bottom level of the pyramid, if they don't have their physiological needs met, it's going to be almost impossible to try to move them up that pyramid. And finally, um, I just wanna end with that, the fact that college graduates are less likely to be in poverty. Um, and you can see that that number is even higher for the students to live in poverty if they don't have a high school diploma. So the fact that children in high school that are from low income families are more likely to drop out, less likely to go to college, um, there's an even higher percent chance that they're going to live in poverty when they become older. So this really is a scary cycle that repeats itself. Originally, I wanted to go over some positive effects of um, the situation and things that we can do as teachers, but there really is just so much information on this topic um, that I didn't really have time to. So here's my list of sources, and these, um, these studies, these things are extremely interesting to read.